integration. Um, I understand that we are taking item seven separately. Is there anything else that should be taken off consent? All right, hearing none, Mr. Tao moves the balance of consent. Roll call. Tao? Aye. Tolbert? Yes. Yang? Aye. Jalali? Aye. Naker? Aye. Prince? Aye. Council President Brenmon? Aye. Seven in favor, no one opposed. The consent agenda is adopted as amended. Item number seven, resolution 21-614, Establishing names for four new parks in the Highland Bridge development. Mr. Tolbert. Yeah, thank you um, for taking this off. And I, I just want to start by saying um, very excited about this, another step in hi the Highland Bridge um, process. And this is one to name four of the new parks that will be coming online in our park system um, for the master development agreement, as well as the park ordinance um, agreement. And here we're bringing um, the, the names for it. And I know Alan Stewart is on for a staff report and we have some special guests, but I, I just want to start by saying it's really exciting um, um, to welcome these new parks to Ward 3. The chosen names of the parks honor our native community to whom the land belongs. It honors our union sisters and brothers who labored on the site for over a century and um, and it also honors our city's interconnectivity with the rest of the region. And the names, um, which we can have more detail on, on where they're going to be located, are uh, Gateway Park, Assembly Union Park, Unchi Maka Park, and Micha Park. And um, they're going to all be fantastic uh, gathering places. And I really just want to thank our Parks Commission, Parks Department, Youth Commission, and members of the Dakota community for pro providing feedback and input as part of the selection process. Um, and I want to also thank many members of the community who submitted hundreds of names for our new parks. And it was really fun to read through and see the different, the variety of names. A lot of young people submitted names, which is great. Um, I appreciate the dedication and energy and time and everything. And I, and I am excited about the future for Highland Bridge. I uh, particularly want to recognize the work of uh, Michela, Barry, Frankie, Maggie, and Crystal, who as members of the Dakota community, I believe, um, some are on the line today, uh, worked with our parks team closely to ensure that culturally significant and appropriate names could be given to the parks at the Highland Bridge site. And, and they're on today's meeting. Um, and thank them on behalf of me and uh, my colleagues and myself. Um, and then additionally, I want to add, we were going to have um, uh, a meeting last night in the community. Um, we postponed that meeting. It looks like it's going to be in May. The focus of the meeting is more on the actual design of these parks, which has also been happening um, with, within the community for um, a, a long time at this point. Um, but it was also to talk about the, to discuss the names as well. But everything we've heard in the community has just been fantastic, positive feedback on all these names. And I think it really strikes a great balance. And beyond the names, the parks are gonna be amazing as well too. So let me turn it over to Ellen. I know she has a very brief staff report and can put some, uh, can put some pictures um, to the park names and, and maybe some more background that I may have not. Welcome, Ms. Stewart. Uh, thank you, Council President. Oh, now your mic is kind of funky. I know you tried it out ahead of time and everything. <laughs> it's, it's real quiet. Like it feels like it's kind of covered or like half in and out. No, it's, I mean, I can hear you, but it's like, Horton hears a who. Okay. Uh, oh, now that's better. Okay, I took my headphones out and I'm just using the mic for my, okay. Thank you everyone, <laughs> I appreciate this. Sorry for the technical issues. Uh, I did try to get on early to make sure that I wouldn't have those, but you can't always prevent it. Um, so we have concluded the design process for the four parks at Highland Bridge and the construction is beginning. Uh, in February, we had an open call for the names for the four parks. And by the closing date in March, the public had generated 
uh, a response that included over 300 names from over 90 individuals. So we were pretty excited about that, uh, the amount of feedback that we got. And in reviewing them, uh, as Council Member Tolbert said, uh, it, it's been a stated priority of the city to include feedback from Indigenous communities. So we put together an ad hoc group of Dakota individuals uh, to take a look at the names and provide us feedback and review on those names that were generated and letting us know whether or not they had some guidance or if they were thinking that there was something that was missing or that we should elevate for consideration. So that was extremely helpful in the process. In addition, we also uh, worked with the St. Paul Youth Commission, which Parks and Recreation actively engages on policy matters and issues of equity. So we had them look at the names and provide feedback. So that is some of the review that took place in order to get, elevate the four names that are in front of you. Um, so it, what you see here are the four parks. Here's Board Parkway, here's Mississippi River Boulevard. Um, so the four parks that are owned by the city are in yellow. Um, and the names are listed here. So the first one is Gateway Park, um, which reflects the importance of this site as you're coming from Minneapolis into St. Paul. It also uh, it also recognizes that they're that we're bridging the past to the future um, here with the Highland Bridge site. Sorry about my cursor. Um, the next park down is Assembly Union Park, and that's the main neighborhood park with a lot of courts and uh, amenities, play area, that kind of thing. Uh, and that stands in the spot where the assembly line was. So that that factory function was in that spot. So Assembly Union Park makes sense for that spot. Uh, the third park includes geography and uh, features that will connect people to the natural environment from the development north. Um, so we've got this entire, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, stormwater area that is in the central stormwater feature, which is a utility feature, and then it's coming down into what is Unchi Maka Park, and that is um, then taking a daylighted stream into Hidden Falls Regional Park. And that is um, Unchi Maka means Mother Earth in Dakota. So the connection between uh, the development and humans, people, and the environment and trying to make that full circle is important in that park. So it made sense to name it that. Um, and then Nietzsche is the final small park here and that it will be largely uh, undeveloped because there will be wetland on it and there's steep hills, but that's also the spot where the coyote families tend to come in and out of the site right now from the uh, CP rail sign. So Micha is the abbreviation for coyote in Dakota. So I do wanna thank the community, the Youth Commission and the Dakota who helped to shape the names and also thank you again to council member Tolbert. And th thank you, uh, Ms. Stewart. And I, and I will add as for the last one for uh, Micha Park, there is a very famous coyote in, in Highland it, it, um, is talked about often on the neighborhood pages. And um, I just saw the other day, I was playing with a tennis ball, it looked like, um, based on the most recent, there's a couple of photographers who's, who get picked almost daily pictures of, of, of them. And it's, 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 it's become a sensation. So I think it, it, it's a, it's, it would be a great name for that, for that area. But um, I don't have much else to say, but th thank you all. And it, like I said, this is another exciting step in, in the Highland Bridge development last week. We passed um, the starting steps of affordable housing. Um, and this week we're passing um, names for the parks. And I know the design features will come later as well as others, so. Great, well, the proliferation of the resolutions coming in from the bridge really shows that there's progress being made. Um, and so that's really exciting. And I think the naming process has been great. I can't, I just underscoring um, the work of our St. Paul Youth Commissioners. They're fantastic and a great sounding board. If you're looking for youth input, it's, um, they have opinions, they will back them up, they'll do the research, they'll follow up. They've been working with us on doing some lobbying, but um, do not overlook that incredible um, resource and body of uh, youth commissioners here in the city. They are fantastic. 
Um, is there any discussion? Um, Mr. Tolbert would move this resolution. Is there discussion on the motion? All right, seeing none, roll call. Tao? Aye. Tolbert? Yes. Yang? Aye. Jalali? Aye. Maker? Aye. Prince? Aye. Council President Brenmon? Aye. Seven in favor, no one opposed. The resolution is adopted. Ms. Nicker moves suspension of the rules. Roll call. Tao? Aye. Tobert? Yes. Yang? Aye. Jalali? Aye. Nicker? Aye. Prince? Aye. Council President Brenmon? Aye. Seven in favor, no one opposed. Rules are suspended. Resolution 21-664, approving the appointment of Christian Butler as Interim Director of the Department of Human Rights and Equal Economic Opportunity. Great, welcome. So this morning we had an opportunity to meet Christian um, briefly at our conversation about administrative citations and previewed this conversation today. And so we have a resolution in front of us uh, to uh, uh, make it official. Um, this appointment as an interim director, and that gives the authority to sign documents and so on. Um, and um, then after we vote on this and make it official, uh, Ms. Moore will swear, do the swearing in. So um, uh, Mr. Tao moves this resolution. Is there any discussion on that motion? All right, seeing none, roll call. Tao. Aye. Tolbert. Yes. Yang. Aye. Jalali? Aye. Baker? Aye. Prince? Aye. Council President Brenmon? Aye. Seven in favor, no one opposed. The resolution is adopted. And and I just, um, first of all, uh, Christian, I am not sure what your gender pronoun preferences are, um, so I don't want to make a mistake here, but I do want to offer you after we do the um, swearing in, if you'd like to share some thoughts about your interim role here, you're welcome to take the microphone. Thank you very much, Council President Brand Moen. And uh, to answer your question, my um, preferred pronouns would be he, him, his. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, Ms. Moore. Okay, Christian, if you don't mind, would you turn on your camera? Oh, I do have it on, actually. Can you not see me? Can. No, I, I, can I can. you? Oh, yep, I can. Okay, that's very strange. Sometimes that you happens. And you're still not. Okay, if you'll raise your right hand and repeat after me. I state your name. I, Christian Butler. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. To support the constitutions. To support the constitutions. Of the United States. Of the United States. And of the state of Minnesota. And of the state of Minnesota. And to discharge faithfully. And to discharge faithfully. The duties devolving upon me. The duties devolving upon me. As the interim director, as the interim director of human rights and equal economic opportunity, of human rights and equal economic opportunity, of the city of St. Paul, of the city of St. Paul, to the best of my judgment and ability, to the best of my judgment and ability. Congratulations. Thank Congratulations, you. Congratulations, Mr. Butler. Thank you, Council President Bren Moen and other esteemed council members. Is there anything you'd like to add as you step into this role or are we putting you on the spot? No, no, that's completely fine. Thank you, Council President. Um, I, I just want to say thank you again to Mayor Carter, Deputy Mayor Tincher, and all of you for having the um, faith and trust in me um, to allow me to step in this very significant role. I do take this work very, very seriously as I do all of, as I do know all of HERO staff does. Um, even though Director Jensen's departure was, um, it, it, it was a surprise for us. I do think that uh, despite my only being um, in this role for two months now, that role being the, the role of Deputy Director of Human Rights and Labor Standards, I do feel she has done an excellent um, job laying a very strong foundation for HERO. And so myself, along with the other staff members, we will just be picking up with that foundation and running with it and improving upon it. Uh, because again, we know just how much the residents of St. Paul depend on uh, what we do for them. And just to give you all a little background about myself, <clears throat> I was born and raised in Nassau, Bahamas. 
Um, even though Minnesota is my home now, uh, Nassau is still very much my home. I do have a lot of close connections there, very um, close family and friends, including my mother. Um, so Nassau will always have a special place in my heart. But I've been here now for the past 20 years. <clears throat> I went to St. John's for undergrad and then William Mitchell for law school. Um, when I graduated, I did work as an associate for the Minneapolis Public School District with their Office of Equity and Diversity. And the easiest way to describe it is um, the Office of Equity and Diversity did for the Minneapolis Public School District what HERO does for the city of St. Paul. Um, after that, I left and went to the Hennepin County Public Defender's Office, where I practiced for nine and a quarter years. Um, I, and even though that was criminal in nature, um, dealing with criminal defense uh, issues of civil rights came up quite a lot. So I am very familiar with that, despite my background in criminal law. Um, I do feel that practicing in criminal law has very well suited me to step into this role, to be quite frank. Um, so, and I say all of that to say again that I want everyone to know that I do take this role extremely seriously and I will do all that I can to make the residents of St. Paul proud of the work that HERO does on their behalf. Thank you again, everyone. Wow, we're, it's, uh, we're lucky to have you. Thank you for stepping into this role. Um, we're really looking forward to working with you in partnership. So thank you and congratulations again. Thank you again, Council President Brenmo, and thank you again, other council members. Bravo. Item number 10, resolution 21-324, approving a lease agreement between the city and the Board of Water Commissioners to lease a portion of board-owned property at 750 Snelling Avenue South for use by the city's Parks and Recreation Department. And on this item, Ms. Yang, I believe, has requested a, a four-week layover, which puts us to, and Sherry, you tell me, May 19th. May 19th. May 19th, um, correct? All right, so um, Ms. Yang moves a two-week layover to May 19th. Any discussion on that motion? All right, seeing none, roll call. Tao. Aye. Tolbert. Yes. Yang. Aye. Jalali. Aye. Danker. Aye. Prince. Aye. Council President Brenmon. Aye. Seven in favor, no one opposed. The resolution is laid over to May 19th. Item number 11 is final adoption of ordinance 20-29, amending chapter 409 of the legislative code pertaining to the distance restriction between liquor license locations and to reduce the location radius for off-sale wine only license locations. Ms. Prince. Oops, Ms. Prince, you may be muted. Of course I'm muted. Um, I, I did request um, that uh, Mr. Cervantes or his representative attend today's meeting. Is, is he here? Yep, I see Mr. Cervantes on the call. Okay. And you're, you're looking for a, a staff report or update? Yeah, I'm looking for an update. Okay. Mr. Cervantes. Thank you, Council President Brown, uh, Council members. Uh, I'm back in front of you uh, in response to request to have DSI staff uh, review the ordinance proposal to reduce the uh, distance requirements for off-sale in creating off-sale wine-only lights. Uh, I want to first say that uh, given the volume of work we've been trying to balance here, we have done some of the review, and I want to lay out that we did take time to review uh, the good work that Stephanie Hart had uh, produced and shared with this group. Uh, we also took more time to review the ordinance language uh, to ensure that we understood what, uh, what the language change would mean. Uh, and then lastly, uh, did a brief review uh, around research. And I think uh, what Dan Nijelic has provided uh, you today is a CDC report. Um, which talks about uh, the guide for measuring alcohol outlets. And then I just want to share some of the findings we had. And then uh, Dan and Jalik also on the call with us today to help answer any questions. And then also uh, provide you with some items for consideration. Um, and so as, 
as we look at um, some of the guiding principles around uh, distance requirements, uh, both for on sale and for off sale, uh, that has a lot to do with uh, studies that have been done over uh, really the last 50 or 60 years um, from the CDC and other uh, organizations that talk about the harm which alcohol uh, can cause, both health and or crimes related to activities um, over uh, intoxication. Uh, aside from what the CDC has recommended over all that time, I think it's always important to just highlight that the use of alcohol um, can have negative impacts generally in community. Uh, what, the, what the guide provides is some of the studies and some of the findings in regards to high density areas uh, with alcohol. Um, and so I just want to put that out there as um, uh, some of the research that's been done in regards to alcohol use. Uh, our observations over the last several years, and my experience working in this field for about uh, 30 years, has been, uh, I would say, changing my, my perspective in regards to density and opportunity and the use of alcohol uh, as I've seen both in Minneapolis and in St. Paul. Um, there has been uh, a very a concerted effort from our state uh, patrol offices uh, to ensure that there have been uh, increased enforcement for uh, DWIs. There's been ample campaigns uh, that have actually yielded um, benefits in regards to the reduction and the number of accidents related to DWIs and safety related to DWIs. Uh, it has actually changed some of the culture related to how people uh, drink at bars, uh, relying on others perhaps to drive and or um, dr drinking more in moderation. Um, my experience uh, in St. Paul is that um, on sale poses its own level of um, issues and problems for the individuals as well as the community. Off sale poses its own um, challenges as well. Uh, what I've seen over the last several years is fewer issues in neighborhoods as it relates to off sale. And so there's been a, uh, there's been a more of an acceptance in uh, providing more access to alcohol in the Twin Cities and really throughout the state of Minnesota. Uh, we have contributed to that by providing opportunities past for on sale uh, liquor licenses by redefining uh, restaurants so that uh, along with parking restrictions and the uh, new definition of restaurants has allowed for more opportunities for on-sale liquor in the city. Uh, in addition, we've also embraced uh, the breweries, uh, which Minnesota has had a great history, and we've increased the number of opportunities in regards for uh, breweries, uh, off-sale malt and off-sale growlers, uh, as well as um, the production distilleries of spirits and off-sale spirits. So if we were to look at a map, uh, which uh, I'll ask if, if Sherry, you might have that map of the off-sale liquor or Dan, uh, Nigelic, if you're on the call, if you want to pull that up. Uh, I just wanted to uh, make one point and there's, there's been an increase in the number of off sales uh, in our city. Um, and then in addition, I wanted to highlight uh, that um, St. Paul, along with Minneapolis, are the remaining two cities that have distance requirements. Uh, and, and I think in part that is because of the high density that we have in our cities. Um, the volume of individuals that consume alcohol and the likelihood that that might uh, result in uh, either some poor decisions and bad behavior, uh, not to mention uh, health issues. Uh, but in the beginning, there were no uh, distance requirements for off sale in uh, St. Paul. And so there are grandfathered um, sites throughout the city that uh, do not meet the current standard. 
and it makes up about one third of the off sale um, uh, liquor licenses in our city. So understanding that uh, what I'm about to say is that I believe that uh, by reducing the distance requirements for a wine only uh, uh, off sale uh, liquor license will have very little impact in regards to what has already transpired with the city of St. Paul. Uh, again, uh, reminding you that the use of alcohol has its own uh, risks and concerns, but the fact that the city of St. Paul um, in its history has not met those distance requirements um, as they were put in place and as we've moved on, we've actually moved in a direction, a trend to actually add more opportunities, uh, more access to alcohol. Um, so uh, what I would ask council to take into consideration in regards to what is being proposed um, are two things. Uh, one is um, the way the language is written, um, it, it is a part of exemption that allow for less distance downtown, which is 300 feet. Uh, I would ask the council to consider uh, separating uh, the section of language that pertains to off sale wine only uh, in its own subsection uh, distinct from the downtown only for clarity and for enforcement purposes. Uh, and then secondly, uh, what was originally proposed was 300 feet separation. Um, we would uh, ask council to consider, uh, again, there is some value in some of the distance and spacing uh, to consider a quarter mile distance spacing for off sale wine only licenses. And then I'll, uh, I'll end there and, and stand for questions uh, as well as our, my deputy director and the job. Okay, so, and I see um, Ms. Prince has a hand up. I just, just to clarify, your recommendation is if we vote on it to amend it to the specifications that you just mentioned? Correct. Okay, um, Ms. Prince. Yeah, um, I, Mr. Cervantes, thank you so much for, um, for, for this report and, and for um, paving the way, hopefully, for us to get this passed. Um, I do want to say I believe this council has already um, amended this so that the distance is, is a quarter of a mile. So that has already occurred. So one of the two amendments is is yeah. taken care of, and then the other one, Miss Prince, is that. Um... And I wonder if we could get clarity on that second amendment so that we can lay. I'm assuming it does need to lay over for that second amendment. Um, so if we could just be clear about that, what that is, so that um, we can get it in for a final vote next week. And then Ms. Prince, just the, when we're saying the second part, it was the first thing that Mr. Rook, Mr. Cervantes said. Right, it said. was okay. pertaining to putting something in a different section so that enforcement would be more straightforward. Yeah, I did, I confess I didn't catch all the details of that. Do you wanna um, just clarify that first part? Uh, Council President Brendan Mullen, uh, Council Member Prince, uh, to create a separate board reference uh, to the off-sale wine-only license establishments that create that um, exist uh, downtown, uh, those that exist outside of downtown. So a section that pertains to this license outside of the downtown. Okay, would it be possible, um, Director Cervantes, for you to get us a, a um, red line version of that so that we could get it into the, um, into Legistar for next week. Um, Council, Council President. Council President Brenmo and Council, um, 
member and I'll uh, have staff work with our city attorney uh, to do that. I, hi, and I see, I, I'm hearing somebody. Hello, um, Council President, this is Dan. Okay, Dan. Yep. Thanks, sir. Real quick, could you, could somebody read the amended language that the council did for the quarter mile? Could I, Ms. Prince, could I just ask, um, given that rather than try to right, do this right. editing at the table, I might hear we you. lay over for one week? I hear you on that, um, Council President Brennan. So Ms. that that is fine. That makes sense. Yeah, just, and that, again, just, it, it sounds like uh, DSI isn't clear which are changes that we've made and there are some right, changes right. they'd like us to make that they can get brought in as an amendment. If they pass, we probably would still have to lay the matter over one week in its final form. Okay. Um, but if that's all right with you, I think it would be easier than trying to um, decipher what's happening at the table. <laughs> that, that makes perfect sense. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I'm just, I'm looking, I'm again doing the trying to look at people's faces, but it seems like there's a bit of confusion here. Um, I see Ms. Nicker and Ms. Jalali with hands up. Thanks, Council President. Um, I'm I'm happy to follow <laughs> Council Member Prince's lead on this. She is the author, but I admit that my confusion is really um, in the nature of the comments that we heard from DSI today. It sounded like policy advice rather than um, uh, enforcement advice. And I, it seems to me that the changes, first of all, the text is right in front of of you, our DSI staff. The quarter mile is written right there. I'm looking at it in front of me. Um, I don't know, Council Member Prince, how long ago you introduced this, but I think it was at least six months ago at this point, maybe longer. Um, I'm frustrated because it feels like we are continually laying this over um, so that DSI can give us the support that we need. And this is in front of us today. I, I think the suggestion to move something to a different paragraph is a semantic change. It's not a substantive change. Um, I think it is very clear from the language what we're talking about in terms of the downtown business district. I'm reading it right in front of my face. So if we have to lay it over another week, work with the city attorney's office, that's fine. Um, but this is just really dragging on and it feels like at this point it's becoming a bit obstructionist rather than actually necessary for the enforcement of an ordinance. And I, I would like to vote. All right, so there's some discussion about a layover and some discussion of just voting. Um, Ms. Jalali. We'll get to a labor or a vote, a vote today, um, but wherever it goes, I guess my two outstanding questions that I'm still wondering are, one, I guess I, I continue to not understand the problem that this ordinance is trying to solve, and I know that there's support for it, so I am asking just from a good faith clarification place if someone who is supportive would be willing to speak to that. That would be helpful for me. And then two, I think um, it would help me to hear that because as a part of the feedback that our office has gotten, there's been questions like, why can't we include all liquor licenses within this? And why is it only wine? And so I don't feel like I have an answer to that. Um, and I would appreciate getting that information. And I guess based on those things, like if we do end up voting today, I am still figuring out whether I could support it because I'm still trying to learn that information. But if we do lay it over, those are things I think would be good to get addressed. So. Um, it's okay if that insight isn't offered now, but that is something that I would find very helpful. Thank you. Ms. Prince. Yeah, um, Council Pre President Brenmon, I, I would like to provide that history for Ms. Jalali, because I, I think whether we lay it over or not, and I'm inclined to lay it over um, to work with, with DSI on this, because I did not know before today um, and before the, all of you, what, what these potential changes might be. So I am, um, I am, I am very happy to lay it over. But I, I just wanna explain the original impetus from, for this ordinance came from a Ward 7 business, Yorg Brewing, that was hoping, it, was hoping to open a next door retail establishment which would help it weather the financial crisis that he was facing during COVID. Um, he, he has a background in wine. He wanted to open a neighborhood wine shop. Um, the idea, we, we faced the um, half mile distance requirement for um, off sale liquor licenses. And we brainstormed with DSI staff. And the idea for um, reducing 
the um, distance for wine shops came from Mr. Nijelic. So this was probably sometime around last April or May when our businesses were just really hurting from COVID. So um, at that point as well, DSI became extremely um, busy with everything that was going on with COVID and, and they were unable to work on it. So my staff person, Stephanie Haar, worked diligently with DSI's input to provide um, a very high level of research and um, community outreach and to, to, to be able to provide that so that DSI wouldn't have to worry about it. Um, just about a week ago, Tom Keim, who owns um, York Brewing and who was the first person looking for this, decided, announced in the Pioneer Press that he's going to move in a different direction for his business. But that said, during the entire extensive community outreach pro pro um, process that we did on the ordinance, we met several business owners who felt that this was an option that they would like to consider in the face of the financial challenges they faced due to COVID. Food businesses that, um, that also specialize in wine felt like this was a change they might be able to take on. Um, my colleagues in Open for Business, Dai Tao and Councilmember Naker both um, have been very supportive because they see this as part of our Open for Business initiative, that we're responding to a business need and that we are creating a business opportunity. Um, as importantly, when Stephanie met with district councils, um, we received district council letters of support from Dayton's Bluff, Payne Phelan, the North End, the Summit Hill Association, Fort Road Federation, and St. Anthony Park Community Council, all of which have significant commercial strips within them. And in particular, I, I recall Summit Hill saying they felt that, well, I think a number of them said that they felt that a wine shop was a retail opportunity that you could put into a relatively small space that would be viewed as a neighborhood amenity whereas off-sale liquor stores carry with them a number of other kinds of nuisance issues and so that they aren't as good of a business neighbor. Um, it's also important to note that the Eastside Business Association, the Payne Arcade Business Association supported this opportunity, believing it was a business opportunity in their Eastside commercial districts and would support local entrepreneurs and finally, the Business Review Council voted in support of the ordinance, despite the fact that Director Cervantes informed them at the meeting that DSI had not yet recommended approval of the ordinance. Interestingly enough, um, it was Catherine Reed Day at the BRC who moved the proposal because I think she felt, as you know, I discussed earlier, that a neighborhood wine shop is a different kind of a, uh, of a neighborhood amenity than a full service liquor store. So um, that's how we got here. And I, I'm really grateful that you're considering it. I hope that, um, that people will reach out to me in this intervening week and let me know what their issues are, but it is really high time um, that I move this off of our agenda and and that, I, and that we're able to offer this during this last terrible year for food businesses as a business opportunity. Um, so if you have any other questions, just, just let me know. Mitchell Ali. Thank you, I, I deeply appreciate that. And it's very helpful to hear how the engagement has, has gone and what's been played back. Um, that is, uh, illuminating too to my question of it seems like the original problem this ordinance was trying to solve was to help one individual business and I had questions at first because it seemed like a citywide policy change to help one person um, it was pretty broad and I did get outreach from business owners who said um, that seems at minimum not fair or questionable but it also um, recognized that since then the engagement has yielded a lot of community support and people seeing that there could be a benefit. So I just wanted to play back where that came from for me because we did get outreach to our office to that effect. And um, 
you know, if the overall intention is help a certain type of business in dire economic straits by changing this, I don't know how true that is given that one business that we started with is changing at the same time. I'm not opposed to easing some restrictions if it's not tremendously um, negatively impactful overall. And I, I would simply add, you know, I, I guess I understand that a wine shop is a different type of amenity than a whole liquor store, but it seems like it would cover more bases to expand it even further. So I just wanted to offer my reaction to what just got shared and in good faith. And I, um, appreciate the conversation. I respect that we'll give this some time, but thank you, Council Member Prince, and to your staff for working on this and for answering my question. Ms. Naker, then Mr. Tao. Thanks, Council President. And I just want to really thank you, Council Member Jalali, for those questions, because I admit I had the same ones at the beginning, especially about the sort of individual business that was the catalyst for this. Um, you know, and I think what, what has really been important to me is um, you know, thinking about how often it is one situation that illustrates for us the need for a broader policy change. It could be a constituent who raises an issue that we then realize is something that um, either could benefit lots of people or or doesn't hurt to change it and to and to liberalize. So um, I I just wanted to say that I, I appreciate you asking about that. And I, I really want to thank Councilmember Prince and the Ward 7 office. They have done an incredible amount of due diligence on this. Um, and the research on what an outlier we are to have these separation requirements in the first place compared to our peer cities, which do not seem to have suffered great ill effects from getting rid of their separation requirements, um, I think is really illustrative. And um, I think whenever we can foster a healthy business climate, which includes healthy competition, and encourage entrepreneurship, especially when the uses, only when the uses are not damaging to the surrounding environment, I think we should do that, especially in this COVID climate. So um, I will be supportive whenever it does eventually uh, find its way to us. Thank you, um, Mr. Tao. Thank you, Council President. And um, thank you, uh, Director Solante, for your staff and your hard work on this. And uh, I know that there's a lot that your department had to handle uh, the last 12 months or so and still to make time to, to work on this ordinance. I, I really appreciate that. Um, I have a just wine only uh, business in Ward 1, uh, Solo Vino. And it's a it's a great asset to to the community you know, along Selby Avenue. Um, I'm in support of this. I don't I I I see this like a like an industry um, or a, a business model, just like someone would open up a gas station or a restaurant. And so um, this you know we we are in a, in a place where um, I like us to be as as uh, attractive as possible for different types of business. Uh, in St. Paul, um, because you know our our sales tax is, is is a big part of our generating revenue for us, and um, I feel that it would it would complement um, uh, the neighborhood, and and so I, I also believe that you know I'm a wine drinker, and um, you know occasionally I'll have it with some spaghetti or pasta or salmon or something like that. Um, but I want to go to a place that just specialize in that, you know, um, and so I, I think that this is a, a beneficial to to the community and that's why I'm supporting it. Thank you, Mr. Tao. Um, so just procedurally, I don't see it more hands up. So just procedurally, um, Ms. Prince, do we, this would be a two week then delay if we say, um, get amendments in for next week to vote in and then likely, uh, if we make the if we make the second change, um, then one more week of layover in its final form. Um, that or if we don't, then it would be in its final form. Um, but that is, I'm I'm looking to you for the motion, I guess. Well, I do not. Um, if I knew where the votes were, um, I would put it to a vote today. Um, for the opportunity to be able to bring people along. Um, I will, I will lay it over. For Mr. Cervantes, do you think we need two weeks to get that language into Sounds final like form? I mean, I mean because other... it would have to be into Legistar, you know, today. So I don't... Ms. Prince, I don't think an amendment needs to be into Legistar by today. It would just need to be into Legistar before our next meeting. 
um, because it it would it would be noticed and it would be on our agenda. It would just be like basically a version two in Legistar. So we don't, it wouldn't have to be done by today, just by next Tuesday or Wednesday. Okay. Um, I will, oh, why don't we just bring it to a vote today? Okay. So Ms. Prince um, moves the uh, ordinance for final vote. Is there any discussion on that motion? All right, seeing none, roll call. Oh, I do, Council President. I oh, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> That's all right. Well, I, I, I've thought about this a lot ever since um, Councilmember Prince, you brought it up, and I've definitely put a lot of thought into it because I feel um, there's a lot of things that get captured in, the, in this ordinance, and it's things that you all have already talked about, which is being a city that's open for business and wanting to create more opportunities. And I'm saying this because I think I, I definitely would have, um, I think I have my thoughts together um, with the layover. I would just have more time to really, you know, think more about, think more intentionally about like my my vote and my decision. But what I what I feel is um, while we talk a lot about the the business opportunity that that this brings, I also feel like we, I haven't heard us talk about what our community needs. Like what do the people that you represent need? I, for me in Ward 6, I represent a, a heavy working class uh, community where we face so many income disparities. Right now, like the largest uh, issues that we are having to figure out is how do we make sure that people in our community are getting vaccinated for COVID-19? How do we make sure that they are being able to pay for rent and have a job that is secure? And also like food security too, which is another really large issue um, within my ward. And when I prioritize like all of these things, I'll be honest with you, like the conversation around um, distance requirements for a wine shop does not come um, up at all. I know that like that is not a need in the community, especially for the people who live, work and play um, in Ward 6. And so I feel like that those are all things I have had to really balance in, in this decision making and um, and why I feel I cannot um, wholeheartedly support the the, um, the ordinance. And I'm somebody who always wants to make sure that when I vote for something, I know deep in my gut that it is the right thing for the people who I um, ran to represent and to fight for as well, especially like working class people. And so because I feel like the current system that we have here does not create um, you know, deep systemic barriers for someone to not be able to run their business. Uh, I, I, and you know, I, I feel like there's actually a lot of benefit to, to what we have today. And, and um, I, I see that and read about that through the testimonies that come in from, from people who do own liquor stores and talk about how sometimes like when they go and, um, you know, look at other like suburban cities where they don't have distance requirements, they're like, where are all like the, the small businesses? Like we feel like they've been driven out. And so I, I think like we have um, a lot of value in in the in what we have today uh, with distance requirements. And, and I appreciate that because um, I feel like it does bring power back to our small businesses. And so I wanted to share those thoughts out to you all. And um, so you know where I stand on this. I will not be supporting the ordinance. Thank you, Ms. Yang. Is there any other discussion on the motion? All right, seeing none, roll call. Tao? So Aye. Sorry, before we do, Council President Brenwin, could you clarify the motion one more time? I'm really sorry. Yep, um, Ms. Prince is moving the ordinance for approval. Final, final approval. Yep. Okay, thank you. Thanks for clarifying it. It's after a long discussion, it's always good to be like, what are we voting on? <laughs> so thank voting you. for a final approval, um, roll call. Tao? Aye. Tobert? No. Yang? No. Jalali? No. Baker? Aye. Prince? Aye. Council President Brenmon. No. Three in favor, four opposed, being council members Tolbert, Yang, Jalali, and Brenmon. The motion fails.
Item number 12, first reading of Ordinance 21-13, granting the application of Burris Pradium Holding, Holding LLC to rezone the property at 1001 Rainy Avenue from RT1 to Family Residential to RM1 Low Density Multifamily Residential and amending Chapter 60 of the Legislative Code pertaining to the zoning map. Um, and this is in our new ordinance process. This is the first reading and I'm, um, I, Ms. Prince, did you need a staff report on this or is it a um, fairly discreet project? It It is very, it's, I did talk to Mr. Dermody about it and it's straightforward. All right. Um, all right. So um, we would, sure, I forgot what we decided, move a one weekly over or do um, you just I, lay it over? I think I can just say that the ordinance is laid over to April 28th for the okay. second reading public hearing. Okay. Keep forgetting that clunky little thing there. <laughs> we'll yeah, work it out. It's, it's a little awkward before <laughs> we figure this out. <laughs> Item 13, first reading of ordinance 21-14, granting the application of L and N Black Properties LLC to rezone property at 554 Broadway Street from I-1 Light Industrial to B-5 Central Business Service District and amending chapter 60 of the legislative code pertaining to the zoning map. And Ms. Naker, do you need a staff report on this item? Thanks, Council President. I did request Mr. Dermody to give a brief one. I think it's probably pretty straightforward as well, but I thought in the spirit of our new process, why not have a quick staff report? Great, Mr. Dermody. Council President, Council Members, hello. Bill Dermody, staff with the Department of Planning and Economic Development. I would like to just show you a, uh, a couple of graphics here. Uh, the request is to rezone the property uh, at 554 Broadway, which is labeled number two, the site in this um, map that I have up on, on the screen. Uh, this map also shows the current zoning. All, all the purple on here is light industrial. Uh, the lighter red is B5 Central Business Service District. And, and you see a little bit of B4 uh, farther west, the darker red in the downtown. Um, this is a request to rezone from the I-1 to the, to the B5 Central Business Service District, which allows uh, some warehousing and uh, trucking oriented uses as well as what the property owner here intends which is to build multifamily residential you know it's currently a construction business they'd like to put multifamily there um, the most unique part about this is b4 and b5 zoning districts is typically thought of as downtown which is typically thought of as inside the interstates, the I-94, 35E uh, interstates in this area. But I did want to point out that we do have um, B-5 Central Business District a few blocks south of here. An existing condo uh, building has that at, at 9th and Pine. And then also the Regents Hospital has that B-5 zoning district. So it is not unprecedented. Uh, I also want to point out that the comprehensive plan calls for this entire area in teal on this map south of Grove Street. Um, it designates it as mixed use. So this is not one of the industrial areas in the city that is long term uh, anticipated to be industrial forever. Uh, only north of Grove is that true, what's more of the purple color on this map. So the comprehensive plan supports it. Also, it's not spot zoning because B5 is compatible with the warehousing nearby. Uh, Planning Commission recommends approval, and we did not get a recommendation from the District Council. Uh, Council President, back to you for any questions. All right, thank you. Um, are there questions for Mr. Dermody? Great. I always appreciate the maps, too, because sometimes it's just hard to contextualize, especially areas outside of your ward, so thank you for that. All right, there are no questions, so we will lay over this item. Yes, the ordinance is laid over to April 28th for second reading public hearing. Item 14, resolution public hearing 21-54, final order approving the seventh place mall operation and maintenance for 2020. And so public hearing this item has, uh, we've taken testimony online and transcribed from the phone. Um, as such, Ms. Naker, we move to close the public hearing and approve any discussion on that motion. Seeing none, roll call. Tau. Aye. Tolbert.
Yes. Yang. Aye. Jalali. Aye. Naker. Aye. Prince. Aye. Council President Brenmon. Aye. Seven in favor, no one opposed. The public hearing is closed and the resolution is adopted. Item 15, resolution public hearing 21-55, final order approving the Grand Snelling parking lot operation and maintenance costs for 2022. And this, this item has been um, held public hearing online and transcribed over the phone. As such, Mr. Tolbert moves to close the public hearing and approve any discussion on that motion. <clears throat> Seeing none, roll call. Tao? Aye. Tolbert? Yes. Yang? Aye. Jalali? Aye. Naker? Aye. Prince? Aye. Council President Brenmon? Aye. Seven in favor, no one opposed. The public hearing is closed and the resolution is adopted. Item 16, resolution public hearing 21-56, amending the financing and spending plans in the Department of Public Works capital budget to add Ramsey County funding for multiple traffic signal improvement projects. All right, and this item has been uh, online uh, public hearing and we've taken testimony um, therefore online and transcribed over the phone. Um, as such, Ms. Naker moves to close the public hearing and approve any discussion on that motion. Seeing none, roll call. Tao? Aye. Tobert? Yes. Yang? Aye. Jalali? Aye. Naker? Aye. Prince? Aye. Council President Brenmon? Aye. Seven in favor, no one opposed. The public hearing is closed and the resolution is adopted. Item 17, resolution public hearing 21-62, approving a lease agreement and parkland diversion for the city to lease a portion of city owned property known as Pig's Eye Regional Park to the Board of Water Commissioners to use for soils um, recycling storage. All right, and I think similar to item earlier on this agenda, Ms. Yang would seek a four week layover to May 19th. Any discussion on that motion? Seeing none, roll call. Tao. Aye. Tolbert. Yes. Yang. Aye. Jalali. Aye. Naker. Aye. Prince. Aye. Council President Brenmon. Aye. Seven in favor, no one opposed. The public hearing is continued to May 19th. Item 18, resolution public hearing 21-78, amending the financing and spending plans the Department of Public Works capital and operating budgets for the 2021 sidewalk reconstruction program, the 2021 Jefferson St. Paul Avenue pedestrian improvement project and the 2021 Griggs Sheffer phase two project. All right, and this has been a public hearing held online and over the phone as such, uh, Mr. Tolbert would move to close the public hearing and approve. Is there any discussion on that motion? Seeing none, roll call. Tao? Aye. Tobert? Yes. Yang? Aye. Jalali? Aye. Baker? Aye. Prince? Aye. Council President Brenmon? Aye. Seven in favor, no one opposed. The public hearing is closed and the resolution is adopted. Item 19, resolution public hearing 21-88 approving the application of Awaken Covenant Community for a sound level variance in order to present live amplified sound on May 9th, 16th, 23rd, 30th, June 6th, 13th, 27th, 20th, 27th, July 4th, 11th, 18th, and 25th at 1200 Montreal Avenue, Highland Park Pavilion. Wow, I'm surprised that's in Ward 2. <laughs> It's, it's it's in Highland. I think it got put in the wrong. Thing. It's the Highland Park Pavilion. It's a ward too. Okay. Yeah. I was uh, like, wow. And I'm, not, and I'm supportive of it, so it's not an issue. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, I think it's a sound right. level variant, so it just defaults. And I'm assuming these yeah. are all <laughs> these are all Sundays. Yeah, They're meeting funny. there. They're going to make noise in Ward Two, though. They're going to drive over. <laughs> <laughs> Sound carries across the ocean there. All right. Um, so Mr. Tolbert moves to close the public hearing and approve. Any discussion on that motion? Seeing none, roll call. Tao. Aye. Tolbert. Yes. Yang. Aye. Jalali. 
Baker? Aye. Prince? Aye. Council President Bredmoen? Aye. The seven in favor, no one opposed. The public hearing is closed and the resolution is adopted. Item 20, Resolution Public Hearing 21-89, approving the application of the University of St. Thomas for a sound level variance in order to present live amplified sound on May 16th, 22nd, and 23rd at O'Shaughnessy Stadium, 2115 Summit Avenue. Um, this has been a public hearing held online and over the phone. As such, Ms. Jalali would move to close the public hearing and approve any discussion on that motion. Seeing none, roll call. Tau. Aye. Tolbert. Yes. Yang. Aye. Jalali. Aye. Naker. Aye. Prince. Aye. Council President Brenmon. Aye. Seven in favor, no one opposed. The public hearing is closed and the resolution is adopted. Item 21, Resolution Public Hearing 21-95, approving and authorizing acceptance of Livable Communities Funds grants from the Metropolitan Council and amending the 2021 budget. All right, this item has a uh, public hearing that's been held online and transcribed over the phone. As such, Mr. Tolbert moves to close the public hearing and approve any discussion on that motion. Seeing none, roll call. Tao. Aye. Tolbert. Yes. Yang. Aye. Jalali. Aye. Naker. Aye. Prince. Aye. Council President Brenmon. Aye. Seven in favor, no one opposed. The public hearing is closed and the resolution is adopted. Item 22, Resolution Public Hearing 21-101, authorizing the city to enter into an agreement for our car to operate a shared electric vehicle fleet. All right, and on this item, I believe we have a staff report from um, our Chief Resiliency Officer, Mr. Stark. Good afternoon, Council President and Council Members. Glad to be with you. I see that I am getting the ability to share my screen here, which I will do. Um, so uh, this afternoon, I'm going to be talking about um, the next two items, uh, not just this item. Uh, there are two items before you, and those are an agreement um, between the city and uh, Minneapolis, and also uh, an agreement between the city and our car. Um, so I'll cover both topics and uh, and then take questions. Um, uh, the project that was formerly known as the Twin Cities Electric Vehicle Mobility Network is now known as the EV Spot Network and EV Car Share. And you can see here uh, a rendering of what this uh, system of spots is going to look like uh, in the near future. This uh, brand that we came up with was in partnership with all of our partners and through some of the assistance that we've received from the Bloomberg American Cities Climate Challenge. This project is part of a longer term vision that we've developed of making sure that 90% uh, of St. Paul residents live within a five minute walk of four affordable, no or low carbon mobility options and emphasizes uh, both uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, but also improving transportation options and access for BIPOC community members and low wealth communities. The need for the project is uh, demonstrated uh, in a few areas. One, the absence of a one-way car sharing system results in people buying more cars. And of course we have goals um, around reducing the amount of single occupancy vehicles and driving uh, that uh, we ultimately want to achieve in order to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. The lack of options also falls hardest on our under-resourced residents and communities. And we know that um, services like this also uh, are attractive to both employers and employees. Um, and so we've developed this innovative public-private partnership that will deliver 70 renewably powered EV spots between the two cities um, and, uh, and a fleet of 150 EV car share vehicles. It will enable us to um, reduce the need to, for our community members to spend money on personal ownership of vehicles, improve mobility and access, uh, reduce air pollution and vehicle miles traveled, as I described, 
and help accelerate the adoption of electric vehicles across our community with a focus on making that charging accessible to renters in particular. All of you I'm sure have seen references to the changes in the marketplace and some of the commitments being made uh, by the car companies, uh, both US and globally, as well as the Biden administration um, that will see a dramatic shift toward uh, electric vehicles in the coming years, with some estimating that the cost of an EV will be um, compatible or um, comparable to that of a gasoline car within just a couple of years. For this project, we've done extensive community engagement with our partners, including our car. Um, we did prototyping work using uh, community focus groups uh, in late 2019 and 2020, partnered directly with uh, the district councils in Frogtown, Payne Phelan, the West Side, North End, and Dayton's Bluff, with a report that was published in February about that engagement process hosted online open houses um, in October of last year, uh, talked with the BRC and the Advisory Committee for People with Disabilities in the fall, and did an extensive survey. Just some quick images of some of that work. Some of the things that we heard from people are that they really want, uh, in terms of the car share service, that they really want uh, flexibility, uh, freedom, and independence, and that those are the things that they valued in the idea of uh, this new service. And the things that they cared about most were the um, time, effort, and reliability involved in using the service. The process of actually selecting the locations for these EV spots uh, was quite technical and involved, uh, but included uh, the starting point of making sure that uh, at least half of our EV spots were going to be in uh, what we used to refer to as ACP50 neighborhoods. I know that uh, that terminology is changing. Um, but our lowest income neighborhoods uh, that are majority people of color, uh, they involved looking at transit usage and demographics and density, uh, places where the service would be most needed and most uh, impactful and effective, and technical details in terms of the amount of curb space available at the, um, uh, in the area. So this is the map that we are currently uh, focused on for the EV spot network in St. Paul. Of these uh, 38 identified uh, locations, uh, 29 are really finalized. Another nine are somewhere in the process of uh, what we have done with the others, which is notification to neighboring property owners and tenants um, to uh, unearth any kind of really kind of fundamental technical uh, issues with uh, or problems with the proposed locations. And um, as you can see, uh, a good cross section uh, across the city covering uh, geography, uh, about a third of the city, uh, kind of in the core uh, of, this, of uh, St. Paul's neighborhoods. So to focus on the agreement between uh, the city of St. Paul and the city of Minneapolis and put it in context, um, the overall uh, investment in this project includes uh, $4 million from the regional solicitation process uh, using federal CMAQ dollars for, uh, uh, that come from the uh, transportation funds, uh, $3.3 million from a US Department of Energy grant and $4 million uh, from Excel in investment in the uh, electric capacity to, um, to power these stations. City of St. Paul has a $750,000 investment in the project and Minneapolis a $350,000 investment. As a result of the disproportionate investment from St. Paul versus Minneapolis, um, we've ended up with 38 locations in St. Paul and 32 in Minneapolis. Um, those local funds were a requirement uh, to match uh, the federal CMAQ funds, as you probably recall. Um, once the uh, charging equipment is installed in these locations, each city will own, operate, and maintain its own EV spots and we will coordinate uh, between the two cities um, on the alignment of parking and pricing. We are still exploring uh, the opportunity for possible sp sponsorship of the system uh, with, uh, with city staff and city attorney's office 
and have agreed with Minneapolis that should a sponsorship opportunity become available, there'd be a 70-30 split uh, in St. Paul's favor in this case because we are the project leads and bearing most of the administrative costs for this program. Moving on to the hour car contract. Um, Mr. Stark, before you move yes. on to the next page, it looks like Ms. Nanker has a quick question. Thanks, Council President. Mr. Stark, going back to the slide before, I, I know when I first saw these numbers, the 750 versus 350 investment from St. Paul versus Minneapolis, and then the 38 spots we get, Minneapolis gets 32. I certainly had questions about that not seeming proportionate. Um, I think you um, adequately explained that and, and cleared my doubts on it, but the last thing I would want is for anyone to feel like we're not getting our fair share and our proportionate uh, return on our investment. So can you just talk about why um, it's that number of spots for that proportion of dollars? Sure. You can you can see from this slide that the majority of the overall funding for this project are is non-city dollars, combination of, of federal and, and XL dollars. And so in a project that's uh, uh, with a total project cost in, in the vicinity of $12 million, the 1.1 1 .1, uh, being uh, committed between the two cities is, you know, uh, just under 10%. And so while we are putting, uh, you know, more than twice as much money into the project versus Minneapolis, um, we figured that the fairest way to figure out the right per, uh, apportionment of spots was based on the sort of cost per location, and that is around a hundred thousand dollars. And so uh, we came up with this uh, agreement between the two cities um, that uh, uh, 38 and 32 was was approximately the the right way to make that split. Um, you know, if it, if this was a 1.1 million dollar project and we were putting in twice as much money as Minneapolis, then we wouldn't think that apportionment uh, would be fair. But because most of the funding is is coming from other sources, we thought that was a reasonable arrangement. We also want to ensure that um, there is a viable system for car share, and we know that car share. Uh, tends to get the most use in the most densely populated areas. And so uh, ensuring uh, the, the viability of that system by serving both cities um, is key. Thank you for the question, Ms. Naker, and for the clarification. I think it's um, that I remember when you <laughs> shared that during our briefing, and I think it is, um, but I didn't until you said it again. And I think it's just, it does put it in perspective. And then also I, I'm just thinking about some of our past investments or it um, and kind of venturing into this work with, um, oh, was it car to go and wanted to, you know, expand it all across the city. And I think it ultimately um, played into its demise, um, but something where we're, and, and that we wasn't, um, easily interchangeable between the two cities. So I think that something like this that has putting, starting us off on the right you know, foot gives us an opportunity to expand um, building on success as opposed to trying to overextend in, from the front side um, and then having it collapse underneath us. So I, I appreciate that information about that, um, why we're tied to Minneapolis in this regard and then also just looking back to the map that we had presented and um, but appreciate the the, cl the clarifying question because of course that that is a there is a big discrepancy there. But when you put it in perspective, it certainly makes sense. Thanks. Thank you, Council President, Councilmember Naker. Um, so jumping to the our car contract, um, the contract ensures that our car will operate uh, our city leased uh, electric vehicle fleet for a five year term. Um, with the option to extend beyond the five years. Uh, the city does have uh, oversight and approval of the rates that our car will charge uh, for uh, using the service, um, as well as um, ensuring in the agreement that there will be a low income rate offering. Um, and I can provide a little more detail on that if it is, uh, if it is needed. Um, our car agrees uh, that they will actually clear the snow from these uh, EV spots um, because uh, it will be easier for them to do it to do a good job uh, in a timely fashion as compared to all the things that Public Works has to clear of snow uh, after a snow event. Um, they are asking and we are recommending uh, that they would receive a two year waiver of paying for parking um, where uh, car share vehicles would end up at metered parking spots um, in the course of their use. Um, 
and that those funds instead in this first two years of operation be focused on additional community outreach and engagement to ensure the success of the program. Uh, the proposal here is that starting in year three, um, our car uh, as the operator would owe the city for the use of uh, metered parking at spots other than the EV spot hubs themselves. However, uh, we've come up with a system whereby they could reduce those costs for parking based on meeting the, the city's um, equity goals for the project. Um, and this uh, system would go into effect um, beginning in year three. And now I'll just uh, briefly outline, this is a draft um, of, what, uh, of what that approach uh, will uh, look like in year three. We want to first get two years of experience with the system before finalizing uh, what this would look like. Um, but essentially the city would um, forgive the, uh, some of those parking costs that would otherwise be due in exchange for uh, uh, our car's direct investments in the community in St. Paul, uh, be that marketing, outreach, uh, partnership with community-based organizations, et cetera. Um, and up to 20% additional credits uh, for uh, outreach activities specifically in ACP 50 communities, as well as up to 30% credits for hitting usage targets uh, for the new service uh, by low-income people and people of color. This would be discovered through surveys of users. Uh, this, uh, the demographic information would not be required um, for, uh, for people to, to use the system and sign up. Um, and so you can see kind of a general outline of uh, targets over time in terms of usage of the system by BIPOC community members, as well as very low income community members and those who fit into both of those uh, descriptions. Um, and this system we believe um, will ultimately lead to uh, the, the car share service uh, having the right incentives uh, to, to market to the folks who we really wanna make sure have access to the service and haven't in the past. With that, um, I will close the presentation and uh, stand for any questions. Ms. Naker. Thanks, Council President. Thanks, Mr. Stark. One quick question and then just one comment. Um, can you just remind us when, when you're talking about the waivers of the need to pay at parking meters, how much you've estimated that will cost the city per year in terms of lost revenue? We've estimated that at about $30,000 a year. It's, a, it's, it's our best guess uh, relative to the former uh, Car2Go system. Um, this system will have a lot fewer vehicles than car to go did overall, um, uh, but we've uh, based our, our guess based on that experience uh, from uh, several years back. Um, so there, there'd be the opportunity for, uh, for our car, the operator, to owe essentially zero instead of 30,000 if they were to meet all of these uh, targets at the end of the system. We believe that actually aligns with the overall goals of the program because by then not having to pay for parking, it also keeps the cost of the service down. Um, and because this is a public private partnership where we want car share to be a, an option for our community, it's a little bit counterintuitive for us to charge them a lot of money to operate to operate the service. So $30,000 a year is our, is our estimate. Great, thank you. I, I... That's really helpful to have that number in mind. And I, I would say, I think that's a really reasonable amount to pay to make sure that the service is equitably accessed. Um, and I, I really, I just want to applaud you and your team for this this very elegant solution, first of all, to use the parking waivers to incentivize making sure this is an equitable service, um, but also these really, I think, ambitious and specific um, targets to try to make sure that we are truly making sure everyone can benefit from this, this important asset. Um, I, I want to just, caution you and your team, and I know you'll be sensitive to this, but just to make sure that there aren't any unintended consequences in terms of incentives to our car to overly advertise to or target or aggressively survey um, our BIPOC communities so that they can meet these targets and save, save themselves the money. Um, I could see that potentially being an unintended byproduct, and I, I think I know you'll design to make sure that that doesn't happen, but um, otherwise just really like the fact that we're being so aggressive and so assertive about making sure this is equally shared. 
Uh, Council Member Naker, Council President Brenmon, I uh, appreciate those comments and and yes, we've been really mindful about the idea that we're we're building something quite new in this relationship with our car, where car share historically has been a service provided by nonprofit or for-profit companies in our community. And really, this is a service now that the cities of St. Paul and Minneapolis are offering to our community, operated by a nonprofit partner. So it really just sort of changes the whole equation and mindset around how we need to how we need to do this. And we are really focused on trying to get uh, to those outcomes that I that I started with, which is reducing greenhouse gas emissions, but equally uh, improving mobility options for the folks in our community who, who need them most. So appreciate those comments. Other comments, feedback, questions, thoughts uh, for Mr. Stark on this, uh, this item, which will also uh, be the report for the next agenda item. Mr. Stark. <laughs> yeah, if I <laughs> if I could, uh, I I was remiss in not uh, thanking the council members um, for their uh, previous uh, efforts uh, and commitments to this project. As you all know, this is now about three years in the making. We're finally uh, approaching uh, the launch of this new service and new system. It's a really big deal. It's a really exciting uh, moment, and um, in particular, uh, council. President for for her guidance on this, Councilmember Tolbert, uh, whose work at the at the tab was was frankly key to us getting this project uh, funded. Um, Councilmember Jalali was able to um, uh, visit uh, the the most comparable service that we have identified anywhere else in the country uh, out in LA with us a couple of years back, and so really just appreciate the engagement from from the council and I, and what I think is going to be a great uh, and long lasting uh, new service in our community. Thank you, Mr. Stark. Um, yes, it does not look like there are other questions or comments, and I think that that in some ways is a testament to um, how thorough this um, program and report is. I feel like every time I had a, but what question that there was a really great answer to it, and um, especially kind of as you're building this and getting out in front of um, our sister city and cities across the country, um, this will be a model for others. And I think that just the, the, the thoroughness and the intentionality, the focus on equity um, is just really admirable. And I appreciate your work on this very much. So thank you. Thank you. So I will take a motion on this item and let's just making sure I believe this was a flip the page too fast. Okay, so this um, this was a public hearing and we did take testimony online and transcribed over the phone. As such, Ms. Nager would move to close the public hearing and approve. Uh, Mr. Tolbert. Yeah, I just wanna take a, a brief moment and, and kind of echo the responses, but um, I almost said Council President Stark, but <laughs> Mr. Stark, um, I had a flashback. <laughs> Um, but I uh, just want to thank you for all your work on this. I think this is, um, you know, one of those things where it adds another really important tool to our transit diversity, and it's really going to be key. Um, I'll say it's not something um, I fully appreciate until we really dug deep at the tab and, and talked about what it's for and actually had to, to explain it to the tab of why it's so important to the, the completion of the transit and in, in this city. Um, and it's just fantastic. So thank you and, and your team, Russ, for all the work that you did on this. I'm excited to support it. All right. Any other discussion on the motion? All right. Seeing none, roll call. Tao. Aye. Tobert. Yes. Yang. Aye. Jalali. Aye. Maker. Aye. Prince. Aye. Council President Brenmon. Aye. Seven in favor, no one opposed. The public hearing is closed and the resolution is adopted. Item 23, resolution public hearing 21-102, authorizing the city to enter into an agreement with the city of Minneapolis, outlining each city's commitments and responsibilities related to the EV spot network and EV share, car share service. All right, and as mentioned earlier, the staff report from Mr. Stark, um, this carries over to this item and we have held a uh, public hearing online and over the phone. As such, Ms. Yang moves to close the public hearing and approve any discussion on that motion. Seeing none, roll call. Tao. Aye. Tobert. 
Yes. Yang. Aye. Jalali. Aye. Naker. Aye. Prince. Aye. Council President Brenmon. Aye. Seven in favor, no one opposed. The public hearing is closed and the resolution is adopted. Item 24, Ordinance 21-11, granting the application of 1164 West 7th LLC to rezone property at 1164 7th Street West from RT2 Townhouse Residential to RM2 Multi Multiple Family Residential and amending Chapter 60 of the Legislative Code pertaining to the zoning map. All right, this item is a public hearing um, ordinance and we've held this public hearing online and over the phone. Um, as such, and we had opportunity for public hearing last week. Um, as such, Ms. Naker would move to close the public hearing roll call. Tao. Aye. Tobert. Yes. Yang. Aye. Jalali. Aye. Naker. Aye. Prince. Aye. Council President Brenmon. Aye. Seven in favor, no one opposed. The public hearing is closed and the ordinance is laid over to April 28th for final adoption. Item 25, Ordinance 21-12, granting the application of Hovda Properties LLC to rezone property at 1219 St. Clair Avenue from B1 Local Business to T3 Traditional Neighborhood and amending Chapter 60 of the Legislative Code pertaining to the zoning map. All right, this is the public hearing that we've held online and over the phone. Um, there are comments in uh, our Legistar system. Um, and as such, Mr. Tolbert would move to close a public hearing. Any discussion on that motion? Seeing none, roll call. Tao. Aye. Tolbert. Yes. Yang. Aye. Jalali. Aye. Naker. Aye. Prince. No. Council President Brenmon. Aye. Seven in favor, one opposed being council member Prince. The public hearing is closed and the ordinance is laid over to April 28th for final adoption. Legislative hearing agenda items or the legislative hearing officer recommends adoption of the following resolutions as no objections to these recommendations were received. Item 28, RLH BO 21-11, 1082 Euclid Street. Item 29, RLH BO 21-9, 281 5th Street East. Item 30, RLH TA 21-180, 1877 Grand Avenue. Item 32, RLH BBR 21-19, 963 Jessamine Avenue East. Item 34, RLH BBR 21-17, 359 Michigan Street. And item 36, RLH BBR 21-18, 454 Smith Avenue North. And the motion is to adopt these items. So moved by Ms. Naker, any discussion on that motion? Seeing none, roll call. Tao. Aye. Tobert. Yes. Yang. Aye. Jalali. Aye. Naker. Aye. Prince. Aye. Council President Brenmon. Aye. Seven in favor, no one opposed. The public hearings are closed and the resolutions are adopted. For the following items, no objection to the legislative hearing officer's amended recommendation were received and therefore she re recommends adoption and amendment of items 33 RLH TA 21-80, 661 Lawson Avenue East, and item 35 RLH TA 21-134, 818 Sherburn Avenue. And again, the motion is to amend and adopt. So moved by Mr. Tao. Any discussion on that motion? <laughs> Seeing none, roll call. Tao. Aye. Tobert. Yes. Yang. Aye. Jalali. Aye. Naker. Aye. Prince. Aye. Council President Brenmon. Aye. Seven in favor, no one opposed. The public hearings are closed and the resolutions are adopted as amended. For the following item, the legislative hearing officer's recommendation is to continue the public hearing to October 13th. It's item 26, RLH TA 21-182, 1323 Barclay Street, and again, the motion is to continue the public hearing to October 13th. 
So moved by Ms. Yang. Any discussion on that motion? Seeing none, roll call. Tao? Aye. Tobert? Yes. Yang? Aye. Jalali? Aye. Naker? Aye. Prince? Aye. Council President Brenmon? Aye. Seven in favor, no one opposed. The public hearing is continued to October 13th. And for the following items, the legislative hearing officer's recommendation is to refer the legislative hearing on the dates that I'll list. Item 27, RLHRR 21-11, 318 Edmond Avenue to May 11th. And item 31, RLHTA 21-158, 936 Jefferson Avenue. And that one is October 5th. So the motion is to refer to the legislative hearing to those dates I mentioned. All right, so moved by Ms. Naker. Is there any discussion on that motion? Seeing none, roll call. Tao? Aye. Tobert? Yes. Yang? Aye. Jalali? Aye. Naker? Aye. Prince? Aye. Council President Brenmon? Aye. Seven in favor, no one opposed. The resolutions are referred to legislative hearings on the dates noted. All right, and that's the end of our agenda today. Before we adjourn, I'd just like to see if anyone has um, thoughts, uh, items, events uh, to share before we uh, adjourn. Ms. Prince. I do. Um, let's see. Thank you. Um, this coming Saturday, uh, April 24th at 9 a.m., Again, the building trades unions will be holding a food giveaway at the IBEW Hall at 1330 Conway Street on the east side. And it starts at nine o'clock and it will run until supplies run out. Um, also this Saturday, um, between nine and 1130, the citywide spring parks cleanup is going on. And there are lots of details. You should go on the city website, um, just enter citywide spring cleanup and you register ahead of time. You pick, you um, determine where you wanna pick up and then there's a place to drop off your um, everything that you've, your full bags of litter at the end of the time period. And thanks to everybody who participates in this every year. It's an amazing, opportunity for us to get bags and bags and bags out of the park. Families, kids, church groups all participate in this and um, hopefully it'll be a beautiful day for it. Wonderful. Thanks, Ms. Prince, for that reminder. It's always, they usually have some colorful garbage bags and you can see just people all over the city cleaning up um, trash and the little um, piles around the garbage cans that are left behind and just re really appreciate how many hands make light work. Um, although there's some places by the railroad tr tracks that I wish we could get the railroad to come and help us with too. But um, but thank you for the reminder. There's parks all over the city that are hosting events and some little small business districts, Rice Larpenter being one of them that is offering a cleanup as well. Um, any other thoughts, comments, events, updates before we go today? All right, um, thank you very much for your work here today. We are adjourned.